Welcome to Greenhouse Educator Training. My name is Garrett Owen, and I'm the Greenhouse Specialist at the University of Kentucky. Today, I will be discussing the basics of hydroponic systems. Before I introduce the different types of hydroponic systems that can be utilized in controlled environments, we need to first look at some of the considerations when one goes to select the system. That first consideration is the intent of why one wants to produce hydroponic crops. Has one determined a market or are you just growing it for pleasure or for education? Once you identify the intent, the market, one can select the appropriate crop to fill that market void or to fill that educational gap that is needed. From the crop standpoint, one needs to determine what are the cultural practices that needs to be taken to successfully produce the hydroponic crop. And what is the production environment that needs to be maintained or manipulated to successfully produce the hydroponic crop. From that standpoint, one needs to determine what is the level of technology that is, that is needed to support that crop and what type of control is needed. And that's what I hope to discuss with you today. When it comes to the hydroponic cropping systems, it's really crop dependent, but in general, they're all soilless. And when I say soilless, I mean there is no filled soil, but it could be either a peat or core based substrate or simply a nutrient solution. But nonetheless, the most common type of hydroponic cropping systems that one sees in production from small scale all the way up to commercial scale can include the Beto or Dutch buckets, bag culture, nursery containers, crates, slab culture, vertical hydro towers, and other types of vertical production systems, nutrient film technique, also referred to as NFT, deep water culture or raft culture. This can also be, to, also be called deep flow culture. So we're gonna look at all these independently. The first one we're gonna look at is the Beto buckets. The images provided here on the screen is the research greenhouses that I currently uh, utilize to produce hydroponic greenhouse cucumbers. And I utilize a hydroponic beto bucket filled with 100% perlite. So as you can see here, we have these 11 liter beige hydroponic beto buckets filled with perlite. We have our greenhouse cucumbers set in the center and we are delivering a nutrient solution to the crop. So as you can see, there is no field soil, no peat, no core that is supporting this crop, and everything is provided in terms of nutrients, aeration based off of the nutrient solution and uh, that perlite. So when one looks at this a little bit closely, you can see that this is a 11 liter container, and I have determined the nutrient solution reservoir. And this is important in terms of these beto buckets. So as you can see that I have a emitter providing the nutrient solution directly to the rock wool cube that supports the hydroponic tomato or cucumber. And this hydroponic cube is set into the beta bucket full of perlite. So when we provide the nutrient solution to the rock wool cube, it delivers the nutrients to the plant, but all the excess nutrient solution trickles down through the perlite and fills into the reservoir. Once we hit the threshold in the reservoir, that nutrient solution spills over to this PVC pipe, and then the excess nutrient solution is taken away from the growing environment. And this is a open system. And what I mean by that is that we do not collect the nutrient solution and to recycle it. So this is considered a drain to waste system. Another type of hydroponic system that is filled with a soulless substrate. Again, hydroponics is basically soulless. So this is a soulless culture system. So it is bags filled with a peat-based substrate that is producing either on the left-hand image, bell peppers, and in the right-hand image, greenhouse cucumbers. 
These bags can come in one, three, or five gallons, and they can be white or black, but this is a common production system that one may see in Kentucky. Another type of bag culture is actually using 3.2 or 3.8 commercial soilless substrates laid uh, horizontally in the greenhouse and um, has a little excision in the bag and a uh, greenhouse vegetable such as bell peppers or jalapeno peppers as you see here is transplanted into those bags and emitters provide all the nutrient solution. So very similar to the images I provided previously, but this is just another type of bag culture. Another type of system one may see in Kentucky or could utilize in a educational greenhouse is nursery containers filled with a peat-based or pore-based substrate. This is a grower in the state of Kentucky that is growing greenhouse tomatoes in nursery containers. And then here's another example of long English cucumbers grown in larger three to five gallon nursery containers filled with a peat or light based substrate. Another type of hydroponic system is using bulb crates. Again, these bulb crates are, are filled with a peat perlite based substrate that has either been lined with plastic or newspaper and then filled with that substrate and a tomato plant has been transplanted in each of the bulb crates and the bulb crates can support multiple crops. The bulb crates can also be covered with, um, say, black plastic, like black mulch that one would utilize in field production to uh, maintain moisture, keep weeds or insects out of uh, the open substrate in the greenhouse. So here's another example of where the bulb crates have been covered uh, in the greenhouse with a black mulch. And not only can bulb crates be utilized for tomatoes or other upright fruiting vegetables, but one can utilize them for melon production that allows the, the plants grow across the greenhouse floor. Another type of hydroponic system and one that is most commonly used in commercial production is slab culture. And slab culture basically is slabs of rock wool or coconut core that is laid horizontally in the greenhouse on risers, essentially. And bell peppers, tomato, cucumbers, or any other type of binding crop is transplanted onto these slabs and then supported by the greenhouse infrastructure and uh, grown in the greenhouse. So here's an example of greenhouse tomatoes in slab culture. These slabs are made of coconut core or the mesocarp of the coconut shell, ground and compressed. Another type of hydroponic system is vertical hydro towers. This is a grower in Virginia that is used a lot, utilizing these hydro uh, towers to produce leafy greens and herbs. And these towers are filled with 100% perlite. The nutrient solution is delivered overhead and it trickles down through the center of the hydro towers uh, to be delivered to the crops. So this essentially utilizes a hanging basket type of nutrient solution delivery system. And here's another example of the hydro tower system in the greenhouse. Another type of vertical system is this one that I have here on the screen. And this is a 100% indoor, relies on sole source lighting from LEDs, uh, growing these kale under the hydroponic conditions. Another type of system is the vertical aeroponics. This is basically a nutrient solution that is sprayed over the roots of plants. And this can be utilized successfully outdoors, but also under greenhouse controlled environmental conditions as well. And at the bottom of these aeroponic vertical towers is the reservoir and a pump. And then inside the tower itself has emitters that spray a mist over the roots. Another very common hydroponic system is the nutrient film technique or the NFP. And this is where crops are placed in troughs or gutters and nutrient solution is bathed over the roots where the leafy greens or herbs 
or even strawberries are placed in these gutters in either rock wool cubes or some type of substrate such as peat or pore based plugs and that nutrient solution bathes over the roots and these plants can uptake those nutrients. So here's an example of more mature lettuce in an NFT type system. As we can see here, a microtube delivers the nutrient solution from the reservoir. It bathes over the roots of the basal plants in the picture in the right. It goes down the length of the trawl for the channel. It exits out at the end. It is collected and then drains into a reservoir. It's pictured here in the photo on the left. And then this is an example of the lettuce grown in NFT. Most often this lettuce is marketed as uh, living lettuce. One other type of system that is very common in commercial production and even all the way down to smaller growers is deep water culture. Here's an example of what a deep water culture or raft system would look like in terms of uh, growing hydroponic lettuce, but this can be utilized successfully to grow herbs. When one utilizes just a pond of water with nutrient solution air stone, I refer to it as deep water culture, but if one puts a pump in this system for recirculation, I call it deep flow culture. So we have a constant flow and movement of the nutrients. So this is an example of the photo on the left of a homemade type of deep water culture system where we have foam boards or foam insulation boards purchased at a big box store has been marked off to the desired plant density per board. And then the transplants are planted into those holes where the roots are exposed to the nutrient solution. The photo on the left demonstrates hydroponic cilantro being grown in deep water culture. The image on the right, you can see that we have hydroponic lettuce grown in the deep water culture on the rafts that are being floated in the nutrient solution. And here's just an example of another type of deep water culture system where you can see the rafts without any plants. And this type of system technically doesn't require any soilless substrate. The nutrients are exposed to the nutrient solution. The only soilless substrate that is required is essentially to produce the young transplants that would be planted into the raft and grown or uh, finished in the deep water culture system. So when it comes to producing the hydroponic crops in these systems, the common theme is that they all utilize soilless substrates or a nutrient solution that supports the crop. So as I mentioned earlier, soilless substrates has no soil, no field soil whatsoever. It's either a 100% one type of uh, aggregate, substrate aggregate, that could be 100% perlite, all the way to a mix um, being peat perlite that can be utilized such as in bag culture. So some of our common soilless substrates, again, 100% peat or coconut poor as the uh, middle image shows, or even the right image, 100% rock wool. But nonetheless, a soilless substrate provides the four main functions of a substrate, and that is plant support, water retention, nutrient retention, and aeration. So here's some other examples of different types of substrates. Not like rock wool, but it is type of a foam. It almost acts like the floral foam one would utilize for flower arrangements, but yet it is a perfect type of substrate to utilize for uh, starting seeds for young transplants of leafy greens or herbs. And then here's another type of system or another type of substrate producing lettuce seedlings in 100% peat moss for hydroponic uh, production. When it comes to providing the nutrients, the irrigation water or the clear water that's utilized needs to be modified by dissolving elements and other additives such as acids or in some instances, potassium bicarbonate to increase the pH to create a nutrient solution to deliver to the plants. And this allows for optimal plant growth and development. For most greenhouse vegetables, a nutritional program is a two-part system. So for example, one starts with clear water. And with that clear water, one needs to determine what 
is the pH, the electrical conductivity or the soluble salt, the nutrient profile, and of course the alkalinity. One once determines the chemical condition of the water. Some decisions can be made in terms of is acid injection needed to neutralize the irrigation water alkalinity, thereby preventing pH drift, but also adjusting the irrigation water pH to the optimal range for crop growth and development. One can utilize sulfuric, nitric, phosphoric, or citric acids, and each of these acids do vary by their strengths or their concentration in terms of the potential to neutralize uh, the alkalinity in the water. Once acid has been injected into the system, calcium nitrate or potassium nitrate can be injected. After that, we utilize commercial blends to inject all other macro and micronutrients to produce a complete fertilizer solution that is delivered to the plants. So what do these systems look like? The image on the left is a hydroponic lettuce production facility for a smaller grower. And then on the right is a commercial system on a smaller scale for a R&D type of hydroponic system, uh, just trialing different types of leafy greens and herbs. So these two different systems are accomplishing the same thing in terms of we have less control in the image on the right in terms of pH and EC compared to the image on the left where we have a little bit more automation and technology incorporation to help manage pH, EC, and alkalinity. And then finally, it comes down to managing the environment appropriately for crop growth and development. And one of the most common practices that one needs to maintain in terms of greenhouses is the light. And when one thinks about light, we can think about light quantity, quality, and duration. For today's presentation, I'm only going to be talking about light intensity or quantity and light duration or photo period. However, all three of these light properties interact to control growth and development of plants that taking part in plant biomass, morphology, and flowering. Starting with photo period, often referred to as dur duration or the interval of time, i.e. the day length between sunrise and sunset. And we need to keep in mind that this changes throughout the year and by latitude, especially in the state of Kentucky. So when one thinks of photo period, we think of the day length in terms of light hours. However, it's the duration of darkness also referred to as the SCOTO period, that signals the influence of photomorphogenic responses. And that's either to keep a plant vegetative, induce a flower, to trigger tuber formation, or any other type of uh, photoperiodic response in the plant. So how do we manipulate photoperiod in the greenhouse? Well, if we have a typical 12-hour day time of light, we have 12 hours of dark time. We can extend the day by adding hours at the end. So to maintain a optimal photo period of uh, 16 hours, one would need to light an extra four hours in the afternoon. We could also truncate our photo period by having two hours of light in the morning from horticultural light in the greenhouse have 12 hours of daylight, and then another two hours in the evening of light provided by horticultural lamps. One can also utilize night interruption lighting, where we have four hours of light from 10 p.m. until 2 a.m. However, night interruption lighting is most often used in floriculture production. So as this slide demonstrates photo period in terms of how it changes from January to December throughout the state of Kentucky. And then this slide demonstrates the latitudinal photoperiodic variation in the state of Kentucky as well. So one can simply utilize timers 
to trigger horticultural lights in the greenhouse to turn on and off, but it's important to keep in mind the natural photo period and to change the timing settings on these light meters so they come on during the times that you want them on and turn off when you want them to turn off. And this all leads up to the daily light integral. However, we need to discuss what light intensity is. So light quantity or light intensity is the number of photons, and that is essentially light particles at each wavelength capable of performing photosynthesis. And light intensity is often referred to as the photosynthetic photon flux density, or PPFD. And the number of photons of light that is perceived by plants ranges between 400 and 700 nanometers. And PPFD is an instantaneous measurement of light. So it's the number of photons that is falling within a square meter per second. And that is reported as the unit of micromoles per meter square per second. And light intensity is important because it manipulates plant morphology and anatomy as well. So we could have shorter plants, plants with thicker stem calipers, larger leaf area, smaller leaf area, and larger or smaller root systems based off of light intensity. However, I mentioned daily light interval previously, and this is a integrated measurement of photo period and light intensity or light quantity, and it is a cumulative measurement over the course of one day, and is expressed as the moles per meter square per day. And this is important because DLI, or daily light interval, influences the growth and yield of most crops. So let's take a look at what I mean by this. So in terms of daily light integral in the state of Kentucky, it varies significantly, just like photo period does over the course of a single day, growing season and month. So in January, you can see that the daily light integral is around five to 10 moles per meter square per day. I do want to note in this, in the month of January, that five to 10 moles per meter square per day is the outdoor daily light integral. Under greenhouse conditions, DLI can be reduced by up to 50% because the greenhouse infrastructure, the glazing material, and if you're producing hydroponic crops that require crop support from the greenhouse infrastructure, you will be blocking out light to other crops or lower leaves on that same plant. So it's important to make sure that we maintain the optimal DLI. So here's an example of growing red oak leaf hydroponic lettuce in a deep water culture system under different daily light intervals. Under a DLI of 12.8 moles per meter square per day, we can see that our red hydroponic lettuce is essentially green. There was not enough light to promote anthocyanin expression in the plants. However, as we increase daily light integral from 12.8 to 32 moles per meter square per day, we had an increase in anthocyanin expression. So we increased the overall visual quality of the hydroponic lettuce. But when we look at these lettuce roots, we've improved the root systems themselves. And this is a uh, effect of light intensity. And when we looked at the individual heads as well, this is changing the morphology of the head. So we have more compact uh, lettuce heads. And also, as you can see visually, there's an intensification of the red coloration of the leaves. And this can also be seen in terms of the green hydroponic oak leaf lettuce is that there is no difference visually in color, but as you can see that there is a difference in the size of the hydroponic head of lettuce when we increase DLI from 12.8 to 32 moles per meter square per day. And these plants, just like the red leaf, oak leaf, lettuce, uh, these photos were taken 21 days after DLI uh, initiation. 
So what are some of the set points or optimal DLIs for hydroponic crops? Well, they vary by the crop and the stage of the cropping cycle. So for example, for lettuce, 10 to 12 moles per meter square per day during transplant production, but we need to increase that to 12 to 17 moles per meter square per day during the mature, mature stage. However, for greenhouse cucumbers, this needs to go all the way up to 20 to 30 moles per meter square per day to optimize flowering and fruit set, thereby the crops producing or yielding more fruits. So when one selects the type of crop, they need to determine the level of technology that is required. And one of those technologies to successfully produce these crops under controlled environment conditions may need to be the utilization of horticultural lighting units. So how does one increase the DLI during winter months or in greenhouse or other types of structures where there may be light limitations? Well, most often times growers need to retract the energy or shade curtains, remove any exterior applied shade or shading compounds such as whitewash, remove any overhead obstructions if possible. That can be anything from growing hanging baskets over the hydroponic crops or even any type of other infrastructure that, uh, that is installed above the crop. One can simply increase the photo period since it is an integrated measurement uh, part of daily light integral, or one can just simply utilize or deploy supplemental lighting, such as this greenhouse operation here, uh, providing supplemental lighting on top of the solar radiation provided by the sun. However, when it comes to supplemental lighting is that most crops benefit from supplemental lighting. However, one should only use it if and only if it helps increase growth, yield, or improves the quality of the crop, and that can be converted over into added revenue, thereby be allowing the crop to be more profitable. Another important consideration is maintaining the optimal temperature for crop growth and development. So some of the definitions that one needs to uh, think about in terms of maintaining temperature is that base temperature, and that is the temperature in which uh, plant development proceeds. So below the base temperature, there is no plant development because plant development is temperature dependent. Optimal temperature is the temperature at which plant development is maximized. And then the maximum temperature is where the temperature above which development ceases. So if we're, if the temperature is too high, the crop will essentially stop developing. And that's where we start to see some heat stress occur. So as I mentioned earlier, plant development refers to uh, the change in meristat meristematic tissues where leaves and flowers initiate and develop. And this is essentially where uh, plant temperature is perceived. When one thinks about temperature, they need to think about the average daily temperature, which is the primary environmental factor that controls the development or how fast or how slow a plant development towards marketability. And that can be even the fruit of that uh, crop as well. And then finally, growth, which is that plant size and the yield is primarily affected by light, water, and nutrients. So if one is providing the correct amount of light, the water through irrigation and nutrients through the nutrient solution, they are optimizing growth. But again, temperature is what dictates plant development. And that can be best seen here. So we have air temperature at the bottom of the figure and at between 40 and 50 degrees, for example, we have the base temperature. So this again is where no development occurs in the plant, but as air temperature increases, say from 40 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, the rate of plant development increases linearly to the optimal temperature. Above that optimal temperature, you can see that the plant will become uh, stress until it stops developing, and that is where we have the maximum temperature. So when growing hydroponic crops under um, controlled environmental conditions, it's important to maintain the optimal uh, air temperature, root zone temperature, plant temperature, or even substrate temperature so that we can 
maximize plant development and get that plant or even that fruit to market as quickly as possible. Some other considerations when selecting the type of cropping system or the technology that is needed is types of crop support. So when one is growing our traditional vine crops, that being tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, eggplants, or melons, under hydroponic conditions in the greenhouse, vertical high wire or trellising systems may need to be installed to support the crop. As you can see here, we have um, hydroponic cucumbers where we have twine and clips supporting the vines and supporting the crops vertically in the greenhouse. Here's another example of uh, hydroponic tomatoes where we have crop supports, where the image on the right is a twine winder, and these winders can be unwound, which lean and lowers the hydroponic tomato or other fruiting binding crop. So it makes that crop easily to work with. In addition to supporting the vines, then we may have to have additional supports to support the clusters, such as in tomatoes, we have truss clusters, as what you can see here. These, uh, these trusses are supported by either hooks or uh, types of clips that we get a nice curve with the cluster. In addition to the different types of systems, one needs to think about pest and disease management options. I'm going to just briefly go over these, but if one has any questions, please reach out to your county agent or the Greenhouse Extension Associate for further questions about optimal uh, pest and disease management options. So the first one is mitigation. One always wants to start and stay clean uh, when it comes to pests and disease-free plants in materials. When it comes to excluding pests, it's always great to utilize some pest screen screenings. Um, this example is a greenhouse completely encased in a screening material that um, eliminates any types of insect into the greenhouse, but these can be simply applied to the ventilators on top of the greenhouse over any type of air intake or sidewalls that roll up or down so that it can exclude any uh, insect feeding pests into the greenhouse. In addition to um, starting and staying clean with sanitation, mitigating, one needs to deploy scouting procedures, utilizing uh, sticky cards or tape to check out the uh, pest population within the greenhouse to determine if one needs to deploy biological control agents or utilize um, hydroponically labeled pesticides for disease or pest control. When it comes to the types of pest and disease management options, one needs to check the label and again, reach out to your county agent or the greenhouse extension associate about weed control within controlled environments, insecticides, miticides, fungicides, or even algae sides that grow on either the rock or the concrete of the greenhouse so that one can keep a nice sanitized greenhouse and growing environment. If one does uh, encounter pests within the greenhouse, you can successfully utilize biological control agents um, with sprinkling bran or using sachets or other type of control methods uh, that have been um, designed specifically to release biological controls out into the greenhouse to help combat against uh, your greenhouse pests on your hydroponic crops. So here's some examples of sachets that can be placed in uh, the crop or placed on the plant, such as the image on the right and the greenhouse cucumber. So with that, I hope I've given you a general overview of the basics of hydroponic systems, how to control the environments and that you can produce a optimal greenhouse crop. But to learn, more about hydroponic systems, crops, or any other thing about hydroponics, I would recommend referring to online resources, talk with hydroponic cropping system suppliers to help design a system, 
And again, like I had mentioned earlier, contact your county extension agent and the UPA House Extension Associate.